focus groups, surveys, things of that nature related to the end user. So if you have, for instance, a product that's for mothers with infants, maybe it's a new crib device or something, then you want to interview mothers with infants. Uh, and you want to interview mothers with infants who aren't related to you. You can ask your relatives what they think, but don't go by what they say because they love you, okay? They don't want to hurt your feelings. Or your wife may be your worst critic. Some of you know, <laughs> I see some heads nodding there. <laughs> so you want to go beyond your family, but you might just start there as a basis. But you interview other people to whom that technology or that application would apply. If it's an industrial product, go to industry, the people that would use it. If it's a, something for a CNC machine, for instance, talk to CNC operators or owners or things of that nature. So you know if the end user really likes this application, are they experiencing the problem this application is supposed to solve? How serious is the problem? What solutions do they have now? These are the type of questions you want to ask. What would they pay for? What are they paying for their current solution? Those types of things. That's your primary research, all under the market research head. Now your secondary research is more related to the industry itself. So if, again, your product is related to child care, you might check with the trade association, go to the trade show, talk to the association about various um, information, ask questions, how big the industry is, how many players there are, blah, blah, blah. That's your secondary research. It's all related to the industry overall. Now that's the first leg of the evaluation process. The second leg is direct review of the competitors, those that are already in that space. No matter what you come up with, there's a good chance there's someone else in the business already solving that problem. And if there is no one in that industry solving that problem, you may have a problem. Your problem may be that no one really cares. Okay, so you want to make sure that, one, people have that same problem, and that, two, they care about the problem enough to buy a solution. So you find this out uh, by doing a competitive analysis, determining who the competition is, what they're selling for. When I was doing phase 10 initially, remember I said I checked who knows pricing. I actually got that information from the buyer. I just asked him, what do you guys buy this wholesale for? He told me. So now I knew what to price my product at. I'm not going to try to go hot to go higher because I've got to compete with the biggest game in the market. So you have to determine those things. And you ask questions of people uh, in the industry to get those answers. And that's you want to discuss and determine the competitive uh, environment. That's the number two leg of the evaluation process. And the third leg is you want to do a patentability check. And you're not doing this just because you want to get want to get a patent, because a patent is not necessary to make money. And we'll get into that later if we have time. It is not necessary to have a uh, patent uh, to make money, and having a patent does not guarantee you will make money. Because I'm sure John will attest to this, and others you probably already know, so few of you probably have patents, that um, the patent examiner is not looking at your widget to determine if it's going to be successful, if it's competitive, how much it's going to cost, if the market likes this thing. He doesn't care about all that. His main concern is making sure there's no prior art in which this item infringes, that it's new, novel, and anything else you want to add. Right, John? Except they don't check for infringement. They right, no, they're not checking for infringement. That's right. Well, they want to determine, I, I guess what I should say, not checking for infringement to make sure it doesn't, there's no prior art that it's... Exactly. So you want to make, they want to make sure that this is new and not. And that's their only concern. They don't care whether you make money or not. Okay, so your reason for doing the patentability is to make sure or determine what else is out there that you might be infringing on, for one. Maybe you're not, but maybe you are. And you want to make sure, secondarily, that determine whether or not you can get a patent. Because many of you will want a patent on your device because... Uh, in my view, patents are really important when you've got something that's you know, new, very novel, technology-based, a lot of moving parts, that sort of thing. If you've got a very simple device that is a fad, it's only going to be around for a couple of years, 
personally, I wouldn't spend money for a patent. Because by the time the patent is issued, uh, your device is probably no longer marketable. <clears throat> but if you've got something that has some staying power, high tech, a lot of moving parts, it's going to cost a lot to build a prototype. If you've got something that costs $50,000 to build a prototype, you want to get the patent first. Okay? So, you want to check patentability. So those are three legs of the evaluation. Market research, the competitive analysis, and the patentability uh, examination. Second leg of the formula is the prototype. You've got to build a prototype. Now some people would say, well, go for the patent first at this stage. And I say, my view is, it depends on the cost of the prototype. If the prototype is fairly inexpensive to build, I would build a prototype first, proof of concept. If the prototype is very expensive to build, as I said a minute ago, go for the patent first. Okay, uh, but that's my view of prototype. And I'm sure others in the room can tell you about the whole prototyping space. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, tell you about my prototype was very inexpensive to build, very inexpensive. All I did was for this particular game, we took an Uno game and took the glue off the box. Turned it inside out. Now I've got a white surface, the size I need it to be. I took the cards, the Uno cards, put them back in the box, closed it, had a friend of mine who's an artist at General Motors do the artwork directly on that white surface. Then we shrink wrapped it, and it looked like a production copy. Hmm. And that's what I presented to the, all the buyers I, I sold the game to. It didn't make, have, at that point, I had not made a single game. So that, that was very easy, but a lot of you will have products that are much more technical and you can't do that. But oftentimes you can cobble together your prototype from other, other products. Now, uh, the third leg is the evaluation PPA. And you can switch the order of this however you want it to be, but you, you do an evaluation of the prototype. Did it do what you wanted it to do? Did it do it efficiently? Was it effective in solving the problem? Those are the questions you have to ask, and you do that in this evaluation stage. Did it really prove the concept? If it does all that, then you go for your PPA. Or you can go for your PPA first and then do another evaluation. Yes? What does PPA stand for? I'm sorry, provisional patent application. Okay, and just a quick Overview, because most of you know what a provisional is. A provisional is a patent application that gives you one year before you have to file a regular application. Okay, one year to you can test the market for the walk, you know, for the uh, marketability. You could do a number of things within that year, but there are some murky areas you have to deal with as far as your foreign rights. Which, to me, again, I just read on this. A lot of people are worried about international patent rights. Again, it's up to you, but. The U.S. buys anywhere from a half, well, I just read recently, a quarter to a third of all patented products are bought here in the U.S. So you might want to keep that in mind when you're looking for your international patents. IP registration, I don't call it protection. A lot of people call it protection. I've got it there for those that like to see protection. But a patent is not really protection. A patent gives you offensive rights it does not protect you from infringers. You have to enforce your rights in order to, uh, to stop the infringers. You have to do something, which means you have to spend money with, with your uh, patent attorney or your legal uh, team. So that you have to determine if you want to do. And then uh, the fifth leg of the formula is licensing and venturing. Now, venturing obviously means you start a business making your product and you make money as a, as a manufacturer, as a business owner. Licensing obviously means you take your product, you go to a company and you say, hey, will you make and distribute this product? If they say yes, you've got a contract, you work that out those details, and they essentially pay you rent to use your product, to distribute it. I've done both of these, as I mentioned, when I started out with my uh, phase 10, I manufactured that for uh, the first six years. 
Of course, I moved out of my parents' basement very quickly. <laughs> you know, we were out of there within a few months into a facility over in Oak Park. And we in that, I did that for five or six years. Uh, had probably six items in the product line. They weren't all phase 10. They were other products. Uh, trivia games. We had a Bible trivia game. We had another card game by another name. And um, so venturing can be, if you ultimately want the license, the best, best path to that sometimes can be venturing. If you can get the product out there and prove that it sells, it's a lot easier to get a license. That's what happened to me. Uh, licensees, potential licensees will come to you when they see it successful. Mattel, who currently licenses Phase 10, has only been licensing it for the last uh, three, three and a half years. For 20 years prior to that, my licensee was a company in Indianapolis, a small second, third uh, tier game company. Uh, and they came, approached me to license Phase 10. So I was in a better position to get a license agreement, got better terms, uh, got upfront money, which is very hard to do. As much as we all want it, getting upfront money is hard to do. But I was able to get upfront money and a lot of things because I had already ventured it, was already selling it. The biggest uh, retailer at that time was selling it nationwide, so it was no problem getting a licensing deal. So if you ultimately want the license, one path is to venture. Uh, again, it depends on your individual circumstances. Uh, licensing uh, is usually the path that most inventors should take, and the reason for that is pretty simple. We'll get into it in a minute. In fact, we'll go there right now. We we'll talk about this. Oh, let's talk. Let's go here for a minute. Market. This goes back to the point of bullet sell and market evaluation, product evaluation. This is called the auto greenwash. A uh, gentleman I know in Arizona developed this. And I'm going to make the, long, the story that's very long, so much short. I was uh, looking through it on the web one day, and my wife and I just discussed buying a car. We wanted this car, we wanted to buy a new car. And her biggest gripe at the time was, you know, the problem with a, a car in this Michigan weather, we moved from Arizona a few years ago, and right now we wonder why we moved from Arizona. <laughs> have to wash the car so often with all the salt and everything. Mm. So she was talking about that the night before. The next day, I wasn't looking for this, but I stumbled across it and just doing my daily news review. And this guy created this, what he called the auto green wash. And essentially what it is, is it's this platform you have in your garage, you drive in at night, you push your button, um, this canopy comes down, it water, it's just a watertight surface, sprays jets and soap and everything all on your car, and then these fans come on and dry it off. And after four or five hours, the canopy goes up, boom, you come out in the morning, take off, you got a clean car. Great concept, great idea. I was thrilled when I saw it. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. this is exactly what I need. So I called the guy, and we started talking about it, and I asked him, how much is that? And he said, it's $29,000. <laughs> With the car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, as much as I would like one of those, I'm not going to spend twenty-nine thousand dollars for it. You never recover the cost of, you know, versus a car wash. If you wash the car every day, you would never spend twenty-nine thousand dollars. So I was, I was not willing to buy one. But I talked to the guy, and he started asking me about possibly becoming a partner, helping him with his venture, and so on and so forth. Because he's a fellow inventor. Long story short, my point here is that this guy, he spent. I think he told me at that point over $300,000 developing this technology. And he could not sell a single one. Not one. So what did he do wrong? No, no testing, no evaluation. Yeah, everything you all said. <laughs> he didn't do any of the proper evaluations. He didn't test the market, didn't know what people would, would be willing to pay. He had some issues with the... Uh, the uh, drying, if you, have a, if you have a car this color, it looks great when it's dry, as it dries. If you have a black car, not so good. You get these little white spots, and it just didn't look very good. He figured that out after he spent two or $300,000. So, you know, we've, uh, we tried working with him. I have a friend who's an engineer, we talked about, he has a production company that makes robotic equipment for 
General Motors, and I brought him in to see if we can get this done for production, the cost down, and so on and so forth. We talked to other guys who uh, live out there, not too far from where I live, and asked them what would they pay for something like this, and the consensus was they would be willing to pay between 10, well, of course, they'll pay as little as possible, but they'll pay 10 to $15,000. They won't spend 30. These guys are multimillionaires. They could spend 30 if they wanted to, but they just would not spend that kind of money for this. Okay? 10 would be great. 15, a few would do that. But all it took was some research to figure this out, but he didn't do that. Could he make it for 10? No. So that's and that's a secondary issue. Right. That's another thing you do in your research. Remember I told you, after you do the initial research, then you do the prototype, then you do another evaluation. Mm -hmm. Part of that second level of evaluation mm -hmm. is figuring out, once you have a prototype, what's it going to cost to make this thing in production? Mm -hmm. You have to have a prototype to really determine it. Right. Okay. Uh, he didn't do, well, by the time he did all this, which he could have figured out before, because he had all these parts and inventory, he knew what he needed, but he didn't do that kind of research in, in advance. He thought he could... So we thought we could get the price down, and we worked at it, worked at it. We thought it was, we could get it down to about 20, okay? And if you eliminated the drying unit, we could get it down a little more. But then the people wanted wet. So those are all those kinds of questions we needed to ask. And by this, I was out of the deal, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened from there. So those are things you have to determine. Uh, let's see. So let's go to IP registration. I'm sure most of you know about all this patent stuff. I'm not a patent attorney. You can ask John and some others about that sort of thing. Uh, patent right, PPA, which is provisional patent. Uh, trademarks, uh, I would definitely recommend you get a trademark unless you have an industrial product. If it's a consumer product, definitely get a trademark. Come up with some kind of name, trademark it. And I'll do that as soon as possible. You could even get an intent or an intent to use trademark, even though you're not actively selling something intend to. I would try to get a trademark. Again, I make money just because I have that name, and I don't even create products oftentimes, as I showed you with the dice game, because I've got that trademark, and people who know it, it, it means something to them. So you want to get, to, uh, get a trademark, apply for that as soon as you can. Copyright is applicable in some cases, not in all cases, but in the case of a card game, it definitely is. The advantage of a copyright is that it lasts my lifetime plus 70 years. So my son hopefully will benefit from this product even after I'm gone. Uh, provisional patent, uh, set the priority date. It's more important now than ever before, and I'm sure you all know about the first to uh, file rule, which makes a provisional PPA more important than it used to be. It used to be first to invent, now it's first to file. So it's really pretty important to go for that if, if you think you want to eventually get a patent. Or just to show you have some level of ownership if you're going to try to license. You can then go to the prospective licensee and say, hey, it's patent pending. That may mean something to them. So you might want to consider that. You got the regular patent application, which you guys know about all that. This is some of the items that are covered by copyrights. You've got catalogs, songs, books, music, websites, computer programs, movies, things of that nature. It's usually uh, copyrights cover the expression of an idea, uh, licensing and venturing. A license is what we talked about before. Basically, it's essentially renting your IP. It's not really your IP, it's your distribution manufacturing rights to a licensee. You aren't really giving them the IP. You're just the, that you're carving out those rights to someone else for whatever period of time you agree upon. Licensing is the easiest path to commercialization and profit. You get paid while a, a business uh, you get paid while a business, your licensee turns your invention into a product. So it's easier for most inventors. Venturing can be Again, it's very beneficial, and I recommend it for the right inventor, those that have the, uh, not only the inventing hat, but also can be very good business people. Venturing would be a good way to go. By the way, if you have any questions, you start shooting out those hands, because I'd be willing to answer any questions you have. Uh, let's see. What does the licensee want? 
they usually want products that are beyond the idea stage. They want something that typically already has a prototype to it. Some will look at ideas that are still in the stage, <coughs> in the stage but most want to see something that already has a prototype and is beyond the idea stage and down the development road. Does the product fit their business model? Uh, that's one of the things you're going to determine in that first area of research. We talked about competition. You want to determine if you're going to license, will it fit their particular business model? Does it fit their, their product line? Question. Yes. That's kind of an interesting question because, I mean, let's say, for example, you license to, com to a company and, and and it was their first game. They made another product, so you're actually taking a big risk. Is that something you really, do you, how, how much do you weigh that? And in, in when you're evaluating licensees, you know, have they done this kind of thing before? Is that, does that dictate like the terms? They've had more success, so that you make your, your percentage might be lower, for example. Um, typically, no. For instance, if you're licensing to Mattel or Hasbro, one of the big game companies, they know there's a range, a typical industry standard. In my case, the company started their business around phase 10, but the guy who started the company was the manufacturer's rep for international games, and international games at the time were the people that made Uno. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that drove Uno to all that success. So yes, there was some risk. I got a higher royalty as a result of that, mm -hmm. and but I knew he knew what he was doing because he drove Uno to the success of software. Yes. Ken, I noticed on your box it says from the makers of Uno, and I, I'm sure that that helps you. A couple of questions. When did you get that on there? Was it the very prototype stage that you just were hoping that would ha happen? or And then do you have to pay some kind of fee to Uno to have that on your box? Okay. Uh, no, this actually just started right there when Mattel took over in October of uh, 2010. Okay. They chose to do that, or asked me if they could do that, because... Um, they wanted to promote Phase 10, and one of the good ways to do it is to let people know that it's from the same maker, mm -hmm. you know, in the same family. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, there's no pay with no fee involved. All right. Because it's the same manufacturer. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Does Hasbro do as well? No, it's Mattel. <coughs> Mattel does, yeah. yeah. Mattel is the largest toy company overall. Hasbro is the second largest. Mm -hmm. Hasbro actually sells more games, though as a category in Mattel. Mattel just started building, building their game category, and they did that through acquisition. Mm -hmm. They don't want to start new games, they'd rather just buy those that are already in the market. <coughs> so have you uh, thought about making a movie yet? Uh, you know, isn't that the big thing now, uh, making a movie out of your toy? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out a way to do it. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah, talk later. Okay, there's uh, a license that you have with The toy industry, they won't do non-exclusive licenses, uh, and they, they want licenses that are long-term. And the only way that they can lose a license typically in that industry is if they don't meet certain sales hurdles, you put in uh, annual minimum royalties, they have to pay me a minimum amount no matter how many games they sell, that sort of thing. But, uh, yes, but they will not um, do non-exclusive. They may carve out geographic uh, exclusion. So you could say, as in the case, I think it's Scrabble. I forget which which, so don't check me on this. Um, but uh, as in the case of Scrabble, Mattel has, let's say, all of North America. Hasbro has the rest of the world. Okay. Hmm. How do you monitor what royalties you would get? I mean, you have to know basically what their sales are is a level of a trust with Mattel that they, they're giving you the proper numbers that you're getting the, how do you know that you're really getting the right royalty? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got a couple of stories, I'll try to make this brief. Just today, see what I do is, I, they give you royalty statements. And depending on how often you get paid, usually it's quarterly, uh, you'll get a quarterly statement. And I have them break the statement down by Products sold, we have about they have about five or six phase ten items in the line. So products sold and uh, a region is sold in and so forth. And number of units. So just uh, 
this weekend, I was inputting, I got my last royalty 10 days ago uh, for the fourth quarter. And I was inputting the data in a spreadsheet that I keep for myself and just to compare numbers and so forth. And I noticed a discrepancy. And this has been going on for a couple years and I hadn't had noticed it before. What happened was on this particular game, the dice version, three years ago, there was a discrepancy, but it was in my favor, and I didn't notice it. Uh, they overpaid me in 2011 by about $15,000. When they corrected that, you know, they, it was a, a, an error in the royalty rate in the computer. Somebody, you know, bad information, they didn't get bad information out, right? So somebody fat fingered a number when they were putting in the numbers, and they gave me too much money. They discovered that and docked me for 15000 in the next year. Well, just the other day, I've been putting data, and I noticed they make an error, and this time it's in their favor. When they made that correction two or three years ago, they put in the number, and this time they put it way too low. And they underpaid me, and I'm still trying to figure out how much. But it's like $500,000 uh, in, in growth sales. And so we're trying to figure out exactly how much. We're not sure yet. So yes. The way you really figure it out is you do an audit, okay? Uh, I haven't done one yet. I've only been with Mattel for a few years. I did an audit with my, with my previous company. That company was called Trundex, and we did an audit. It's a long story. I won't get into the whole story. I was in the middle of just getting ready to start litigation with them. I went into litigation with them in 2008. The litigation lasted two years. I spent about $500,000, and... Just before we started the litigation, I knew it was coming. I performed an audit. I hadn't done one in 15 years. I don't recommend you do that. Wait that long. We did the audit, and they were, wouldn't give us all the information, but they did give us the, the most recent two years. In those two years, we discovered they owed me $100,000, okay, because they didn't pay me on service dues and so forth. And they wouldn't give us anything beyond that, so we knew there was a lot more money. By the time we did, went through the litigation, did all the work, we found out they owed, and they paid me that 100000 right away. Because the, the worst thing in licensee, the one sure way for them to lose their license in court, because everything else is, but is the material breach, how badly were you hurt, and John can say all these things. And all, you may not be able to pull a license from them, but if they don't pay you your royalties, you can yank the license very quickly. So they paid me the 100000 right away. We finally did, after, toward the end of the litigation, we did the, the balance of the audit, and we discovered they owed me about 850000 bucks. And I, once we settled, long story short, I got, was able to get that money back. So audits are the, way you, the only way you really know for sure. And you build that into your license agreement, that you have the right to audit at whatever time frame you want to, to do that. And you have to pay for it unless you discover a discrepancy of whatever percentage you agree upon. You can say if there's a discrepancy of 5% or greater, you have to pay it, the licensee. If it's less than that, I'll pay for it, or whatever number you agree upon. And also, in, in your agreement, you may negotiate how that royalty report is, is produced, and it may identify the, the buyer or you know the, the different buyers, and you can actually go to them or, or try to look at their records or hire a private detective, policing is one thing, but you can, you know, typically negotiate something where you get, you know, where they're kind of going. You can go look at the store and see, you know, are they selling 500 a month or are they in every Myers store and they're selling, you know, 25,000 a month? Well, see, if you can break it down to stores, I've never seen that before in mine. I've looked at hundreds of license agreements. I've done a lot of consulting to other inventors. I've never seen that quite, that provision, but you typically, you will see an audit provision and a who will pay for it provision based on discrepancy percentages, and uh, you'll see, uh, you'll also see provisions in there where they will allow you to do an audit, but you have to perform it within a certain time frame. Anything beyond that, you can't do. Yes, sir. Have there been any cases where uh, a company will enter into a license with an inventor, and then they just sit on it, and the inventor gets little or nothing? There have been cases of that, but you can avoid that. Uh, again, I mentioned before, typically in license agreements, those that I've seen and consulted other inventors on, you will have a provision in there that says, one, 
they have to uh, actively market your, your invention. Now, what that means, the lawyers can fight about it. But one way we can determine that is, two, they have to generate a minimum annual royalty to you. And so on a take or pay basis, they have to pay you that whether they reach that sales volume or not. That gives them an incentive to continue to try to sell your product. Another, another provision could be if they have a certain minimal sales over a year or two period, they reach some low level deal, you get to pull the license back. So you negotiate those things in advance. There is no license agreement that's ironclad, you negotiate everything. When I did the deal with Mattel, we had, again, I told you I was in litigation with uh, my former licensee. Uh, that company was about to go bankrupt. I didn't know this at the time, but the litigation was really hurting them. Uh, obviously, I spent a lot of money. They spent probably 50% more than I spent. That coupled with the distraction, coupled with the fact that we were in the banking <coughs> crisis back in 08 and 09, the banks were really concerned about if they lose this license, they're going to be in big trouble because it accounted for 40% of their free cash flow. Mm. They had 700 SKUs. Phase 10 accounted for about 20 of them, yet it accounted for 40% of their free cash flow. So if they lose that, they got really big problems. So their bank was not going to extend them any more credit. And at one point, it eventually called their loan. So they were really hurting. And um, long story short, when, I just, when the bankruptcy issue came up, they wanted me to negotiate with a private equity company uh, because the private equity company said, look, we'll rescue you, Fundex, that's the company, but you have to, we have to first get an agreement with Ken to first pull the litigation and two, allow us to transfer the license to anyone we want after whatever period of time, five years. Because you know what private equity companies do. They rescue failing companies and then they turn around and sell them, right? Well, they wanted me in advance to give them carte blanche to send the license to anyone they want. <laughs> now, I did not want to do that. Because if you have a license, you want to know who that licensee is, what their performance are, if they can in fact produce, uh, keep your brand going strong, those types of things you want to know. So you never want to give a licensee the right to transfer your license without your approval. And so that was in the agreement that was in dispute and they wanted me to allow them to do that. Now, I wouldn't go for that, so the private equity company, they all flew here from all over the place. It was interesting. I, um, they were going to go bankrupt on a Monday. They called me the previous Thursday. They said, Ken, private equity company, got to meet with them. He won't save us from bankruptcy. If you don't meet with them, we're going to file bankruptcy on Monday. I said, okay, file bankruptcy. <laughs> My attorneys said, well, Ken, you should at least listen to them. So they said, okay, they all jumped up, came from Connecticut, Illinois, all these people conversed, and I said, I'm not going anywhere. They have to come to me. So they all came here. We met at the airport, hotel, whatever it's called down there, and for five hours, they tried to convince me to allow them to